again to the recorded section of the meeting. Um, uh, I, I would like to uh, welcome um, um, Shama Shahadat from Eberhard Karls University Tübingen, who will speak to us today on the difficulty of ending a story uh, on the thick novels of Russian realism, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. And uh, Shama's uh, Savisednik will be Kate Holland from uh, uh, University of Toronto. Shama, please. Hello, thank you. I would also uh, um, like to, to thank everybody um, and um, also the Jordan Center. Can you hear me? Okay, um, the Jordan Center uh, where I started my fellowship in March, which I had, which I had to interrupt because of Corona, but I got into the Tusovka, I could say, of, of, the, uh, of the Jordan Center. And I will now um, share my screen with you in order to show you my... Um, um, my slides. I will read my paper. I, have, I hope that is okay. And, and when I'm too, too fast, you just have to interrupt me, please. So, the difficulty of ending a story. The first person narrator in Lawrence Stern's novel, The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy, is a passionate talker, as already becomes obvious in the first sentence, where he does not really manage to begin his story, although a text and a life need a beginning. He stumbles, loses his way, and his speech develops along a contingent line of, so of thought. I will not finish that sentence till I have made an observation upon the strange state of affairs between the reader and myself. This is from the uh, fourth chapter in um, Stern's novel. I am in this month one whole year older than I was this time 12 months, and having got, as you perceive, almost into the middle of my third volume, according to the preceding editions, and no farther than my first day's life, it is demonstrative that I have 364 days more life, to, more life to write just now than when I first set out, so that instead of advancing as a common writer in my work with what I have been doing at it, on the contrary, I'm just thrown so many volumes back with every day of my life to be as busy a day as this, and why not, and the transactions and opinions of it to take up as much description. Viktor Shklovsky quotes this passage in 1921 in his article on the parodistic novel Stern's Tristram Shandy. Stern's narrator does not master the beginning of the novel because details are disturbing him. They get in his way. He wants to talk about his birth, but he does not succeed. Shklovsky calls Tristram Shandy the most typical novel of world literature, characterized by a poetic disorder. That disorder is created by the life and opinions that constantly interrupt the narrative, so that Tristram Shandy cannot finish the sentence, or by the way, most of, this, of his sentences. Beginnings are difficult, since every novel has to set a new beginning. It has to create a new world, and it has to connect to a reader, to lead him or her into the text. Once the reader enters the text, his or her desire is awakened, to generate meaning of what he or she is reading. Hang on. Oh, sorry. Desire is always there in the start of a narrative, often in, the, in a state of initial arousal, often having reached a state of intensity, such that movement must be created, action undertaken, change begun, Peter Brooks writes. Speaking about the Odyssey, about Ulysses, Brian Boyd asks how a text can be original and timeless at the same time. How does, a, how does a Homer appeal both to his immediate audience who know the tradition and to future audiences who may or may not know them? The reader, Boyd writes, must be willing to invest costs, energy, and time in an exchange for pleasure provided by the text. Reading for Boyd is an act of exchange, compensating the apparent uselessness of art. While the beginning is fighting for originality, while at the same time referring to tradition, the ending, which is my topic today, has another problem. Novels, especially Russian realist novels, try to evade the ending of a narrative. While Tristram Shandy does not manage to tell the beginning, the Russian novels are unable to finish. Narratological approaches dealing with the endings of texts see the ending as a problem of narratives in general. D.A. Miller, specialist for English literature in the 19th century, 
see the nature of stories and the fact that they are dealing with insufficiencies, that at the center of the narrative, something is lacking. For example, a husband, if you think about Jane Austen's novels. And as soon as absence is transformed into presence, as soon as a husband is found and a marriage takes place, the defect is fixed and the novel can end. The production of narrative is possible only within a logic of insufficiency, disequilibrio, and deferro, to quote Miller. This means that the narrative and the ending are in an unreconcilable relationship. As soon as the novel is ended, there is nothing more to tell. Or the other way around, as soon as a deficiency is fixed, when the marriage takes place, the novel is over. This ending, however, can only be reached in an act of force. The narrator pretends that the world is transparent, transparent, as if there was no more lack and nothing more to tell. Miller develops a theory about the ending of the novel with examples from the 19th century, Jane Austen, George Eliot, Stendhal. I would like to argue that the attempt for closure in novels is, in Russia, not only problematic for the novel in general, but especially for realist writing. Dostoevsky's and Tolstoy's novels do not easily come to an ending. Epilogues and explanational essays artificially extend the novels. The authors cannot stop to talk, to write, they cannot stay silent, and the result are thick novels. Tolstoy's Roman. So why is the Russian realist novel a thick novel and why does it have difficulties to come to an ending? Ideas concerning this question will make up the first part of my talk. I will then look at an example of a failed narrative closure, turning to Tolstoy's War and Peace, and finally I will take a look at Dostoevsky's Prestoplenie in Nakazanie, Crime and Punishment, which presents the reader with another type of ending than Tolstoy. In both novels, however, the ending is deferred and no real closure is reached. So um, this is how I will structure my talks. You have the re research question and then uh, the various um, chapters, sub-chapters. I will start with, uh, of course, Russian realism, the problem of closing a narrati narrative. The Russian realist novel, more than the Western European novel at the same time, had to, to carry the burden not only to de depict life itself, but at the same time, it was a stage for reflecting on philosophical, religious, and political questions. Discourses in Russia in the 19th century were less differentiated than in Western Europe, which resulted um, um, in, a, in, a, in the novel, sorry, in the novel as a genre that served as a platform for debating issues that could not be debated in a public space, like in England or France. While Western European realism focused on the problem of mimesis, Russian realism was concerned with God, with the nation, with life and death, with freedom, nihilism, and the new man, among others. So much, in short, about Russian realism. But what about the ending? The classical work on narrative ending is Frank Kermode's The Sense of an Ending from 1967. Kermode here connects the end of the world, the apocalypse, with the end of the narrative. He sees the ending as a connecting force, as a chance to create a coherent thread between beginning, middle, and end of a narrative. However, modern literature, and if this is a punchline of Karamot's argument, often turns against this expectation. It is always um, not doing things which we unreasonably assume novels ought to do, connect, diversify, explain, make concords, facilitate extrapolations. In his text on fictions, Kermod mentions two aspects which are important for the narratability and the ending, chronos and kairos. Chronos means the undifferentiated flow of time, mere successiveness, while kairos captures moments of crisis. Between beginning and ending, only moments of kairos are narratable, while the flow of time, chronos, cannot be recounted. In War and Peace, Tolstoy tries to describe the flow of time after ending of the novel. While the novel narrates moments of crises in war and in love, the epilogue tor turns to the everyday after these crises have been solved. He thus moves into the realm of chronos, and I would say he miserably fails. There is nothing to tell. 
Uh, I will talk about that later in detail, of course. To wrap up my argument, narratability and the ending are closely linked. Change, movement, and a lack that has to be filled can be narrated, while stasis cannot. This linkage, linkage can acquire different forms. One could, like Jean-Paul Sartre and La Nausée, argue that a beginning is told in order to reach an ending. Une chose commence pour finir. A thing begins in order to end. One could also argue that the ending can never have the totalizing power which it pretends to have. Endings are usually forced. They do not come about naturally and they relate in different ways to the text and to the world. Tolstoy's War and, War and Peace and Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment present two different types of endings. While Dostoevsky wraps up the action in a short epilogue and tries to bring the preliminary ending of the novel into a final ending with a perspective on salvation, Tolstoy, in his very long afterword of War and Peace, loses his narrative thread and any narrative logic gets lost. While Dostoevsky attempts a closure, Tolstoy does not even try. Um, I come to my second subchapter and I will formulate five hypotheses regarding the endings of the thick uh, Russian novels. Um, that's the first. Okay, the realist novel has to write against other epochs and other media. Realism, as is well known, is writing against romanticism and sentimentalism. An obvious example is Dostoevsky's Biedny Ludi from 9, 1846. This leads to my first hypothesis. The realist novel is the answer to the romantic fragment. Both romanticism and realism aim for totality, but in different ways. Novalis writes, nur das Ganze ist real, only the whole is real. Since this monumental task can never be solved, for him poetry is an allusion to infinity, Andeutung des Unendlichen. For the German romantics, poetry is the incorporation of infinity. A Russian example for a fragmentary ending would be Pushkin's Evgeny Onegin. After Tatiana declines Onegin's advances at the ball, although she is still in love with him, she leaves him, standing alone. But not only does Tatiana leave Anjegin standing around, the narrator leaves him as well. This abrupt disruption is provoking for the reader, just like the narrator's request that the reader should not read a novel up to the end. Blažen, kto praznik žizni rana, a stavilni da piv da dna, pakala polna va vina. Kto nie da čo, je jo ramana, i v drug umjel rastać sa s nim, kak ja s Agnieginim majim. The ending of Evgeny Agnieginim is a plea against an ending, for not reading until the end. Vladimir Nabokov's commentary about the end of the relationship between writer and hero, and especially about Evgeny Agnieginim, sounds like this. When we wonder about the destiny of an author's creation beyond the horizon of a discontinued romance, two feelings prompt our fancy and direct our conjectures. The character in the book has become so familiar to us that we cannot bear to, bear to have him depart with, without leaving us some address. Madame Bovary is finished not only because Emma has killed herself, but because Omer, Omer has at last got his decoration. Anna Karenina, Anna Karenina is finished not only because Anna has been crushed by a backing freight train, but because Leovin has found his dog. But Anjegin is not finished. The ditched hero without some address is, like the empty verses in Evgeny Anjegin, a definite refusal for a realistic ending. In his tr uh, translator's epilogue, Nabokov also mentions Pushkin's, quote, difficulty in waning himself away from Evgeny Anjegin. Nabokov here imagines an emotional connection between author and hero, so that the finishing of a book comes close to the breakup of a relationship. About the emotional bond between writer and hero or, her or heroine in Russian literature, other remarks have been made, like that Dostoevsky is in love with Stavrogin or Tolstoy with Anna Karenina, and that only when Tolstoy didn't love Anna anymore, he was able to throw her under the train. Um, 
I come to my second hypothesis. Uh, while the realist novel is on the one hand polemicizing against the fragment in the field of literature, on the other hand, it has to deal with reality, since mimesis, the depiction of this reality, is a poetic principle of its kind. A metapoetic paragraph from Stendhal's uh, Le Rouge et le Noir, for example, reduces literature to a mirror. Ah, my dear sir, a novel is a mirror taking a walk down a big road. Sometimes you'll see nothing but blue skies. Sometimes you'll see the muck in the mud piles along the road. And you'll accuse the man carrying the mirror in this basket of being immoral. His mirror reflects muck, so you'll accuse the mirror too. How does a realist novel produce what Roland Barthes calls l'effet du réel, the reality effect? How does it pretend that it produces a maximum of world within a minimum of medial disturbance? Or to reformulate the question, how does a realist novel pretend that it is reality, not language? One strategy to create the reality effect is the realism of det details. The novel is filled with details which have no narrative function, whose only function is, as Barth writes, to cry out, we are reality. The more detailed the description, the thicker the text. A consequence of this relation to reality is, hypothesis three, um, the process of deliteralization de of literature. Renate Lachmann has shown that the realist manifestos with a criticism of re rhetoric devices led to the demand for an unliterary literature, which means that author like, authors like, for example, Nikolai Czernyszewski tried to produce a reality effect by writing unliterary literature. Literature had a hard time to prove itself as a media to depict reality when alternative media like photography came up as a rival. The thick novels of Russian realism, one could argue, have to make an enormous textual effort in order to be successful as a media guaranteeing reality. Just as Scheherazade in A Thousand and One Nights uses the infinite, infinite narrative against death, the thick novels defer the end in order to survive as literature in unliterary times. Hypothesis four. Um, on the one hand, the novels try to approach reality with the help of many words by describing it as precisely as possible and by making the reader forget that they are literature. On the other hand, aesthetics forces its way back into the text, even though Pisaria, for example, in the 1860s defined aesthetics as a nightmare. Russian realist literature had to deal with the tension between facts and fiction, between reality and literature. It is not by chance that many protagonists in these novels are scriveners, copyists, who combine, combine infinite writing with the unstoppable compulsion to speak, to repeat, to begin again and again. These scriveners are predecessors and metapoetic incorporations of an unstoppable desire to speak and to write. At the same time, the mistakes these characters make when they are copying texts refer to the fact that it is impossible to copy the world correctly and that mimesis does not work. The writing of long novels thus is less an attempt to copy the world than an exhibition of the failure to do so. Hypothesis five, with my last fifth hypothesis, I finally come to the argument that is in the center of my talk the impossibility of the ending in the realist novel. While literary critics demanded in unliterary literature, the authors continued to write novels, where their narrators and the characters eloquently and with many words talk and write, thus fighting against the death of literature. But no matter how much text is accumulated, the novels will never manage to copy reality. They can never copy, copy the whole, cover the whole, even though they try. And that is another reason why realist novels often cannot come to an ending. Their desire to cover as much reality as possible, to depict the world as completely as they can. Dostoevsky's novels, for example, are not individual novels, but part of a megatext consisting of all his novels in combination. The Idiot is a novel about the perfect man, while The Devils is a novel about man's evil side. Tolstoy added an explanation to his Kreutzer Sonata, just as Turgenev continued his, his father's and son, sons with an explanational essay. 
In realism, it seems impossible to bring the text to a standstill, and the authors defer the ending with the help of an epilogue by telling the further destinies of their heroes and heroines in time lapses, like Dostoevsky, or they let them fizzle out half-heartedly, like Tolstoy. The authors of realist novels, not only in Russia, seem to be unhappy with their endings in general. One example of British realist literature would be George Eliot's Middlemarch. In a post-narrative chap chapter that is called Finale, um, a post-narrative chapter that is called Finale describes the character's destinies after the novel. However, these future destinies are completely different from the goals that the characters have pursued for hundreds of pages. Since these goals were not realistic, they had to be adjusted or given up, but only after the novel ended. As a revised order, closure always implies a background of renunciation, sacrifice, and loss. It can never, therefore, provide an organization wholly adequate to the narrative that has preceded it, Miller writes. The finale in Middlemarch confronts us with the defeat of the characters and of the novel. Every limit is a beginning as well as an ending. Who can quit young lives after being long in company with them and not desire to know what befell them in their after years? Here you have the, uh, you transcend the, the novel, the text basically, and, it is, and the time is called after years. For the fragment of a life, however typical, is not the sample of an even web. Promises may not be kept and an ardent outset, outset may be followed by declension. Latent powers may find their long-awaited opportunity. A past error may urge a grand retrieval. The ending of Tolstoy's War and Peace is very similar. The idyllic life of the family is basically not narratable. It cannot be told. told. It is Kronos, not Kairos. Instead of the passions and actions that have governed the narrative for over, over a thousand pages, the epilogue tells us about a couple that is getting increasingly more comfortable. If this is a result, one could argue, the effort of war and the effort of reading are hardly worth it. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, promises a better life than the reality of St. Petersburg in the second half of the 19th century, since the epilogue in Crime and Punishment relates to a better, godly, and transcendent world, which is prefigured in Raskolnikov's Siberian catharsis. catharsis. So I now turn to Tolstoy's Vaina Emir, The Deferral of the End. War and Peace is an ex ideal example for the deferral, deferral of the end. While the first version of the novel, the proto version from 1867, ends with a double wedding, a happy ending, Tolstoy later adds an epilogue of 200 pages dedicated to the time after this happy ending, which of course is not the only change in regard to the proto-version. For example, in the uh, proto-version, Andrei Balkonsky survives and mar gets married while in the... Um, does he get married? Well, anyway, he survives. Um, but he dies in the, in the, in the version we, we usually read. Um, and I do not want to go into detail about the various different versions, but I want to focus on the fact that it was difficult for Tolstoy to begin the novel and it was difficult for him to end it. Similar to the narrator in First Room Shandy, in his beginning Tolstoy moves further and further into the past. In a draft to the foreword to War and Peace, he writes that his original plan was a novel whose hero was a Decembrist returning to Russia with his family. Um, Involuntarily, I went back from the present to the year 1825, but in 1825, my hero was already mature, a family man. In order to understand him, I had to turn to his youth and his youth fell together with the era of the year 1812. So from 1856, I moved to 1805. And from then on, I decided to put not one, but many of my heroes and heroines through the historical events of 1805, 1807, 1812, 1825, and 1856. Other than Lawrence Stern or his narrator Tristram Shandy, Tolstoy does not turn this dilemma into an artistic device, which shows that the space of the text is restricted while time is in infinite. Instead, he moves his narrative into the past from 1856 to 1805, where he sets his beginning with a discussion about Napoleon in the drawing room of Anna Pavlovna Shera. Just as complicated as the beginning is the ending, in the last chapter of the novel, Natasha is thinking about Pierre who went to Petersburg. She's missing him, 
and dreams of marrying him. Marie Balkonskaya, whose brother Andrei, has been, Andrei had been in love with Natasha, is very critical about Natasha's feeling. The ending seems to be open. Только для чего же в Петербург вдруг сказала Наташа и сама же поспешно ответила себе, нет, нет, это так надо. Да, Мари, так надо. The epilogue begins with the word прошло семь лет после двенадцатого года. Seven years passed since the year 12. Speculations about history follow until the narrative thread that was lying around in the open ending of the novel is taken up again. We learn about the weddings and the married lives of Nikolai Rostov and Marie Balkonskaya and of Pierre Bezukhov and Natasha Rostova. Instead of ending the novel with a wedding, or as in the proto version with a double wedding, the epilogue narrates what literature usually does not touch, at least in the 19th century, the every day after the wedding. While nearly every novel of world literature prefers to have the heroine die instead of giving, giving up ideal love, from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet over Rousseau's Julie up to Virginia Woolf's The Voyage Out, Tolstoy's novel with its realistic poetics turns to the profane every day and describes how the slim, dynamic Latasha, Natasha turned into a plump, broad mother. Not only does Tolstoy argue against romantic love and against the emancipatory positions of the nihilists here, also, he does not want to end his character's lives artificially with a wedding. Patti follows the narrative thread further beyond the wedding into married life, thus creating the reality effect by including Kronos, the unspectacular flow of time, into his novel. The character subversively undermining the reality in War and Peace is in this case not a language deficient scrivener or copyist, but a living corpse, the, the old Countess Rastova. The Countess was already more than 60 years old. After the quick successions of the death of her son and her husband, she felt herself to be casually forgotten in this world, without aim or sense. She ate, drank, slept, was awake, but she didn't live. Life didn't give her any impressions. She needed nothing from life except of peace, and this peace she could only find in death. The Countess is similar to the novel that is actually already finished, but which is still written on. The Countess, like the novel, will not die, although she is hardly alive anymore. For 20 more pages, the epilogue goes on about the perfection of Natasha's and Pierre's, Pierre's married life. Since this perfection has already been sufficiently described, the novel seems to be treading water. With the second part, the end of the epilogue is once again deferred, since it starts a new story and contains the author's musings about history, until finally, the epilogue stops at an arbitrary point with the word Kanyets, the end. I will now come to the epi my epilogue or prospect, Dostoevsky's Pristuplenie in Nakazanie, Infinity Beyond the Text. While Tolstoy cannot stop writing in order to avoid the end, or is on the, uh, the other way around, avoiding the end in order to go on writing, Dostoevsky's epilogues are around 20 to 30 pages long, summarize the further destinies of the protagonists and try to finish the storyline. But although from a narrative point of view, it is a closure, from a metaphysical physical perspective, it is also an opening into a brighter future, a vision of salvation which the critics and the readers do not always find plausible. Paradoxical and surprising turns, however, are typical for Dostoevsky's narratives. While the devil, the de uh, yes, it, the devils put a, put, put a real end to the novel and to the narrative since most of the characters are dead by then, Dostoevsky's first thick novel, Crime and Punishment, has a preliminary ending that points beyond the narrative. Olga Hansen Löwe interprets the ending of the novel as the ending of the world, transcending historical time as we know it from Tolstoy. Dostoevsky's novel about a strong personality beyond the moral law, as Mochulsky writes, ends with Raskolnikov's confession after Sonia has looked at him with a tormented, desperate um, expression, no, um, expression. The novel itself ends with two rows of full stops, reminding the reader of the empty stanzas in Pushkin's Evgenia and Yegin and marking the repetition of the story, which Raskolnikov tells in his confession and which the reader has just read. 
This ending is followed by an epilogue about Ras Raskolnikov's spiritual rebirth. The first word of the ep epilogue, Sibir, already contains, in short, the whole terror of Raskolnikov's punishment in a heterotopic location. Siberia is constructed as a kind of purgatory, as a space of rite de passage, ending in a spiritual rebirth. How this happened, Raskolnikov didn't know, but all of a sudden, this is typical for Tolstoy, of course, this Vdruk, all of a sudden, it was, as, as, it was as if something caught him and threw him in front of Sonia. He wept and embraced her knees. Immediately, in this moment, she understood everything. Her eyes began to shine in an endless happiness. Both, both of them were white and thin, but in those white and thin faces, already a new future was awoken, full of resurrection into a new life. It was love that resurrected them. The sudden transformation evoked by love, which Sonia understands without words, and the expectation of a renewed future beyond, beyond Siberia moves the resurrection to a space beyond the text. Atama glabo i sastavić tjemu nova varaskaza, no teper ješni raskaz naš akonšin, is the last sentence of the novel. Neither marriage nor death mark the ending as we know it from the English 19th century novels who Miller examined. Instead, spiritual renewal and a resurrection that points beyond the text. Historia pastipienava abnavlenia čalavjeka. And now come to my, to my own ending. Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, end summary. Tolstoy and Dostoevsky try to depict the world as completely as possible, an effort that results in abundant talking in repetitions and details. Their goals, however, are different. Tolstoy focuses on the historical development, on the narrative, which leads him far into the past from 1856 to 1805, and then in the end into the future of married life. The narrator finally gets lost in his own narration when the story evades his control. Dostoevsky, on the other hand, sees the development of his heroes in the bright future, promising resurrection. It is a future that needs not be told, but that is already implied in and guaranteed by the Performative Speech Act. Thank you for your attention. That was it. Whew. Thank you very much, uh, Shama. And uh, now we will hear Kate, uh, uh, Kate's response. Shall I uh, close my, um, I, I close my, my, yeah, my slides. Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, great. Yes. Um, thank you very much to the Jordan Center. Um, thanks very much to Sharma for a great talk. Um, this is really a topic which um, is, um, I think, um, familiar to many of us, especially as we um, so frequently try to fit these novels into syllabi um, <laughs> as we teach them to students and wonder how on earth we can uh, fit them into the semester. Um, so I um, very much liked your um, series of explanatory hypotheses, um, which um, contextualize the problem of uh, ending within literary history um, and begin to theorize them, um, engaging with Peter Brooks, with Frank Commode, D.A. Miller, um, and others. So I'm just going to sort of briefly um, kind of recapitulate those and then move into a few different directions, uh, mm -hmm. ask you a few questions which you're welcome to either answer or ignore, whichever uh, you prefer. Um, so um, your first hypothesis, so the realist novel um, is the answer to the romantic fragment. Um, so Eugene Onegin, of course, kind of refuses to end in a, in a conventional way. Um, in a sense, um, we can talk, we might want to talk about dead souls there too, although obviously external circumstances here very much play into um, to the, to the, to the question of ending there. Um, and we move, of course, into crime and punishment and war and peace, which um, I think very much seem to be uh, um, tr trying to set themselves against um, uh, that romantic fragment. And then the second um, um, hypothesis, so the mimetic principle versus the formal requirement of ending for meaning making, right? The ending is necessary in order to 
to, to make meaning and yet obviously it flouts the, um, uh, the, the mimetic uh, principle. Um, is it therefore necessary to abandon the mimetic imperative for the sake of the formal imperative, right? Does form um, need to be prioritized here? Um, and, then, um, and then thirdly, realism as the expulsion of literariness, right? That the mimetic imperative, imperative entails making form invisible, right? Or making it, making it not obvious. And of course, ending is the ultimate in, in, it's impossible to hide an ending, right? There is no way of making it seem, um, seem natural, right? Um, and then um, fifth, um, this dilemma, um, so however much the realist novelists try to copy life, right? They're never gonna be able to do it wholeheartedly, right? They, they cannot relinquish form completely. Um, and the novels they write do have to end after all, right? In the end, there has to be some kind of way of making them end. Um, the one thing I wanted to do is to take the, the, the argument in another direction. So um, when you quoted Miller, you talked about sort of the, the forced nature of ending, right? But I sort of wanted to speak for endings and their ability to kind of create meaning. Um, and um, so um, Brooks, I'm just gonna, just gonna say a little bit about Brooks's argument here. Um, so Brooks argues in Reading for the Plot, which you quoted from, um, that narrative um, uh, plots are structured by two impulses that are similar to the, um, uh, to the two drives that structure human experience. So on the one hand, eros and the erotic drive, on the other, the death drive, right, Thanatos. Um, and that plots are driven by the tension between the urge um, to get to the end as quickly as possible, right? To, uh, which reflects the death drive, right? The need to get to that end. Um, and the countervailing um, impulse um, to delay, right? To avoid end at all costs, to um, take a, um, a detour in this kind of space of, space of creativity and this kind of uh, energy of plot and narration and, and, and put off the, the ending. Um, and, but Brooks also quotes Benjamin um, in uh, the, the Storyteller, um, the idea that only at the end of stories, right, in the, in the deaths of fictional characters, that's the only place where we can kind of fully achieve the kind of totality that is denied to us by virtue of our own mortality, right? We can never get to the end of our own lives and kind of have a full perspective. So it's only through, um, through reading these novels, through getting to the end that we can kind of achieve this kind of totalization. Um, so even, in, even though these endings seem forced, right? Um, but the, um, sorry, um, just needed to, my screensaver has gone. I just have to unlock my screen. Sorry about that. Just need to see everybody again. Okay, here we go. Um, so yeah, that the, this, the, this for, form provides knowledge, right? And it's only through this ending that that kind of a knowledge of the whole becomes possible. Um, so ending also provides totality and it gives a kind of meaning. Um, and I think that that um, there's the sort of value of ending perhaps becomes um, uh, more um, obvious to Tolstoy in his late period, right? Which is of course where we where we find the shorter works, right? Where we move, where we find poverty and short stories instead of those long novels, um, and the kind of narrative desire, right? The sort of um, the eros, right? The the erotic drive is kind of it, 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 he is trying to trying to to uh, repress that as much as possible, right? So here, ending maybe becomes something that's much more valued. Um, and so um, I um, now I'm going to move on to the question of Tolstoy versus Dostoevsky, right? Kronos um, versus Kairos. Um, war and peace versus crime and punishment. Um, in a sense, these two um, models of time, right, are, are as you pointed out, um, also two different kinds of non-narratability, right? Kronos um, is impossible to narrate for, on the one hand, and Kairos is also impossible to narrate on the other. Um, so um, 
and as you pointed out, um, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky both avoid endings um, in different ways, at least in um, uh, War and Peace and in Crime and Punishment. Um, Nata um, Natasha's collapse into the banality of routine, right, and family life on the one hand, and um, Dostoevsky's gesturing out beyond the universe of the novel um, into this kind of putative future or this kind of extension out beyond um, the limits of the novel form. And I think that this is true in, in ver to varying degrees of all, in all of Dostoevsky's endings, that there is this kind of move out into the infinite. Um, but I just wanted to kind of, to, to, to also go in two different directions here. So one is, um, so you, you talked about war and peace, but I'd be interested to know um, a little bit more about how Anna Karenina might fit into the project. Right, because um, um, we, on the one hand, of course, have the at the end of um, part seven, the dramatically uh, dramatic and narrat narratively satisfying ending of Anna's death. Right, but then we move into um, into part eight, which, of course, as we all know, is um, a part that often students struggle with. Right, which readers struggle with, um, where we, in a sense, Tolstoy there seems to be kind of melding. Um, Kronos and Kairos in some kind of a sense, right? But do those, do in, in Levin's, um, uh, in the Levin plot, right? In, in Levin's kind of um, Kairotic moment, right? His kind of moment of some kind of a, of a oneness with the universe. But at the same time, also everything is just the same, right? He still shouts at the coachman and so on, right? So, um, and, and so I'd be interested to know how, what, what you thought about the ending of Anna Karenina. Um, and then um, to move again into the question of late Tolstoy. So um, the, the sort of emphasis there seems to be more on also on, on Kairos and especially on um, the, the problem of narrating death, right? Which it becomes explicitly thematized um, in those late short stories. Um, and then also, uh, and then on uh, to move to Dostoevsky. Um, so I agree with you about um, it, it in many ways, but I think that there's also kind of a, a deferral of ending in crime and punishment as well, and particularly um, in this um, very strange and intriguing um, penultimate paragraph of the novel, um, where um, he the the narrator refers to. Um, a, Raskolnikov's great future deed, right? His podvik that seems to bring back echoes of the, the rest of the novel, right? That seems to somehow resist um, this kind of move out, or, or at least it kind of, it moves out into the future, but past patterns can also not, not really be left behind. Um, so there seems to be kind of no clean ending there either. Um, and then um, I was also wondering, so, um, I was wondering about Padrostok as well. Um, the he, Padrostok, in a sense, seems to be a kind of return, in a way, to kind of the fragmentary poetics of Romanticism, right? There seems to be here um, uh, Dostoevsky, in a way, here is relinquishing um, uh, uh, endings, but in a different way, right? There seems to be more here um, a, a, a return to there's there's so much fragmentation, so kind of fragmentary poetics. Um, uh, in Padrostok. Um, and then also, um, uh, I was wondering too about the, the end of um, Brothers Karamazov, which seems um, too much more, I would say, a dear to your, to your argument with crime and punishment, right, of kind of moving beyond, out beyond the future of the novel, and maybe even kind of, it's interesting how at the end of that novel, um, uh, Alyosha Karamazov even even seems to kind of acknowledge non-narratability, right? As he kind of talks about in the future, right? We will all narrate what we have seen, right? That we're all going to move out into the uh, into the future there. Um, so I think I'll I'll finish there and um, and see if you would like to respond um, to any of those points. Thanks. Um, thank you, Kate. That was. Um... I can't see myself. It's kind of strange. Uh, ah, here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Kay. <laughs> that was uh, was very interesting. I hope I can can catch everything or most of it. Let me start with Padrostok because this we have to 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 lay aside because that was a novel that I read like thirty years ago, and it is it was on my reading list for the, for my last vacations, and I didn't read it, so I cannot say anything about it. It's Fair really. Enough. 
I, I just for I don't know. I have to read it again to reread it. Um, so 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 I'll start with your uh, beginnings. Um, you asked when you were um, re re uh, recovering my my hypothesis hypotheses. <laughs> uh, you asked about dead souls, and um, I uh, Susan Russo actually uh, wrote about the endings uh, in Gogol. She she uh, d distinguished between a conclusive closure and a promissory closure in, in Gogol's text. So I didn't use this here, but of course, uh, Dead Souls would be, I think, uh, well, would be a promissory closure because it promises something to come. And and then, well, as we know, it didn't really work out. So, um, and about the fragment, what I also wanted to add here is that uh, War and Peace, I think it's very strange. You have this long, long novel, and then you have this abrupt ending, and it is kind of a fragment. So you have a novel that is over a thousand pages long, and still is a kind of a fragment somehow. Um, yeah, that was one thing I wanted to add or to answer. I don't know. Um, a form. Yeah, you you wrote about. I I read your article today only, so <laughs> I didn't use it. But you wrote about this uh, uh, about Benjamin and the, the the eros and Thanatos and the drive versus the delay to and the the avoidance of the at the ending. And I I really like that idea. I di didn't it didn't occur to me, but it's it's really, yeah, I I like that. Um, what we have to think about that uh, Thanatos, we usually have dead women. It's uh, Elizabeth Bronfen uh, wrote this book over her dead body, so you always have these these dead women. And this takes me to Anna Karenina as well, because um, actually many people do not remember that the novel goes on after Anna is dead. Like my colleague said, what? I did not even. He, uh, Bronski went to Serbia. I didn't. I did not remember that. I read the novel. I didn't. Did, don't remember it. So I think uh, the, the logical ending would be the dead dead woman, uh, <laughs> and it, it just goes on. And it is a little bit, I think, like like uh, Vainaimir, because um, you could also, yeah, you could could finish there. And he 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 goes on. <laughs> he always goes on. And uh, you you said it's a melding of Kronos and Kairos, maybe. Um, yeah, maybe it is. I don't know. I would have to look at it, but I, I think it's it's a good idea. And um, the death, the death which Tolstoy describes in his in in his um, in his short stories in his Raskaze, they are always very long. I mean, people don't die easily with him. It's not like they are they just die, but he, they, they it takes them a long time to die. So this um, somehow fits, I think, into into his um, into his system, and um, one would have to look at it, what it, how it is different or not. And also, um, if you look at Tolstoy's biography, he he was preparing for death for a very long time. I mean, he thought he would die, and then he lived on for like thirty more years. So, so this is the same same problem in his in his life as he has in his in his uh, books. Um, Anna Karenina, that's what you asked, yeah. Um, ah, uh, Dostoevsky, Bratya Karamazovy um, is also very, it's a very interesting ending, I think, because the epi uh, epilogue corrects the error of the law. You ha you, the, the novel ends with, with, the, with the wrong, with the wrong, um, with the wrong murderer, and then the epilogue has to correct this. So once again, you you transcend the the, narr the basic narrative, and and we are led into another um, into another world or another yeah another cosmos, you could say, or mor moral cosmos that uh, Dostoevsky opens up, and um, past patterns, no clear ending in, uh, in, uh, in Prestoplini in Nakazanie. Yeah, ah, exactly, that's what I thought. It fits into the idea that, uh, that Dostoevsky's individual novels are not individual novels, but they are part of a megatext. So you, of course, you have, have, have repetitions that, are, um, that come up. Uh, Patrostok, I can't say anything. Um, that's what I said. Yeah, I think, I don't know whether I answered all of your questions, but those were some of the ideas. What else did I have? No, I think that's it.
Ah, uh, Biese is a bit different, I think. It's strange, but that Biese, because, it, because everybody's dead, we don't have any other novel with so many dead people as, uh, or dead characters as we have in Biese, and that is, is much more close than the other novels. Why that is, I don't know. We have to, maybe it's because uh, it, it's a novel about the evil, evil man, and maybe that's why Dostoevsky doesn't want to, to open up into a brighter future, I don't know. <laughs> But yeah, that's that's it basically. Great, thank you so much, Emma um, and Kate. And so now we move into the question uh, answer section of the talk. And uh, Sasha, am I correct in saying that uh, we, people, since we can't really see everybody on the screen at the same time, it would be great if people just typed in question into the into the yeah, chat. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no need to use the raise your hand feature. Just send me a message if you'd like to speak or you can write your question in the chat and I'll read it aloud. And I've opened up the chat, so you can go ahead. Maybe if somebody has a question right away. Uh, Anne, please. Unmute yourself, please. And we can't hear you. I don't, she might not be able to unmute herself because I couldn't. Needed to. Oh, wait, now I'm unmuted. Sorry, it didn't unmute before. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry, I, I was, I was going to refrain from going first because my question takes us in a slightly different direction, but it's about serialization and um, what is the relationship possibly between serialization and you know, loquacity, not ending, going on and on. Um, I, I, was, I was interested in that. And um, one thing that made me think about it is years ago, I had an undergraduate who wrote a thesis on um, the way that other writers and letter writers in the thick journals freely kind of riffed on the novels that were being published in the, in the um, thick journals and made up their own continuations of the stories made up their own additions to the stories. Um, so I'm wondering if there's something about the format of publication that also um, uh, discourages ending. Um, I, shall I answer first? I, I, in, I don't know about Tolstoy, but about Dostoevsky, because uh, clearly he, um, his novels um, belong to the genre of the sensational novels, and Dostoevsky was always short of money. And um, this is also one, one, that was one of my ideas, I didn't put it into the talk, but that he, he had to go on writing. It's like this, this uh, anecdote about uh, Mayakovsky, that he, has a that, that he was paid by the line, and that's why all his lines are only one word, or the, the verses are so short. And with Dostoevsky, it's the other way around, he writes more and more more. And um, he also, you, you see, I think when you read the novel, you can see where one, um, one series ended because it's Vdruk Anavashla. Suddenly she came into the room and everybody froze. And then, you know, that was the ending. And uh, the, next, uh, the next part would be in the next journal because people were waiting for what, what was going to happen. So um, I think uh, for Dostoevsky, this is probably uh, very, a very close uh, um, connection between the serialization and the the ending, but uh, or no ending. Uh, I don't know about Tolstoy. And also, uh, if you think that, of course, before the 18th uh, before the 19th century, the novels were also very thick. So Thackeray or whatever, um, they they uh, were also thick, but they had different reasons. I think. I think it's very special for the realist novels to be so thick because they want to cover the whole world. While, for example, with Tristram Shandy, it was also establishing a new genre. The novel was very new, so people had to, uh, the authors had to write a lot, or Clarissa, if you take Clarissa, it's, it's never ending. It's also, but it's, it has, I think they have different reasons um, to, to be so thick than the 19th century novel, actually. Thank you. That's really interesting. And also, I just want to say that this makes me want to teach War and Peace again. And I have not War and Peace in probably five years. I had a bad experience last time I taught it, but this makes me want to try again. So thank you very much for the talk. 
But Anne, we talked about this. I also had a bad experience teaching. I know, I don't know how to teach war and peace. So I know. students like it. I don't, I don't know. I was very disappointed from my experience as well. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Chloe Kitzinger. Chloe, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Thanks. Thanks so much for the talk, Shama. It was uh, really fascinating. I'm wondering if you would entertain the idea also of a counter impulse in 19th century Russian literature, um, which we could sort of think about as the problem of the middle that there is an ending there from the very beginning that we're all waiting for. And the question is kind of how to delay it for long enough to make a novel. Um, and here I'm thinking particularly of Idiot, where there's sort of this overdetermined um, death of Nastasi Filipovna, which is prophesied right from the beginning, right, of, of this murder. And the problem is really how to delay long enough to try and tell this story of the good or perfect man in between the beginning of that story and the end. And I'm thinking also of Oblomov um, as another novel where his death is sort of there, right? Right from the beginning and the beginning and the end of Oblomov are the very clear high points, I think, for anyone who reads it. But then in the middle, there is again, this story of virtue that they're trying to, that Goncharov is trying to, to fit in, right? Trying to make room for. Um, so, I guess what I wonder about is whether uh, your argument is um, sort of too homogeneous to cover the whole tradition, right? Whether that's one aspect of it, but maybe there are other relationships also between the beginning and the end and the middle that we could think about in, in Russian realism. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah, probably. It's interesting to think about the middle if you think about um, Ablomov and the, uh, the Ablomovka and the the um, the whole story is is um, retarded or re, um, is stopped basically because the idyllic idyllic space does not give you any the, any any time there is no development and it's it's stopped so um, it's um, I think for example in Ablomov it is it is a subvert subversiveness <laughs> so uh, it is put into the story in order to to undermine the realistic develop the realist development. So the um, I think it, it does. It's not a counter argument, but it even fits because um, it stops it stops the narrative. It, it because in, in realism, like like Tolstoy, for example, if you take the the epilogue of of War and Peace, it's very strange because it is so boring. Also, and nothing happens anymore, and this is and, and you don't know you don't really read any, every line because it is not it doesn't fit the narrative, and it is also somehow subversive. And also this fragmentary ending, the stop stopping somewhere is also subversive. So I think you always have have both sides in 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 a text, and you just have to find them. In Ablomov, the subversiveness is in the in the in the idyllic uh, scene that is in, inserted into this realist uh, novel and in uh, war and peace it's actually the epilogue the epilogue and um which which uh, breaks it up um so i think the system works but you have to find out how it, it works differently it's not always always the same um and in idiot um so so you would say how 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 to delay the the question is is why why would you delay you could also write a short story but they don't and in, in the odd maybe it's also connected to Anne's question because uh, Dostoevsky had to write more in order to earn more and to to make it in, to to turn it into a sensational novel so that people would read it this is also connected in in delaying the end if you have a short a short text it's not as exciting usually and it's not as sensational was my answer clear? I don't know. I had many various ideas about this, but basically I would say that you always have a counter action in the text, uh, something sub subversive, like in Ablomov. Ah, thank you. Uh, Melissa Fraser, if you'd like to ask her a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. 
Hi, Shama. Thank you. And Kate, thank you. And I'm going to have to run immediately and I'm distracted and doing a million Dean things. So I'm really sorry. But when you were just talking about War and Peace and teaching War and Peace, which I actually love to teach, I taught it this summer to incoming first years over Zoom, a five week class. Wow. Uh, and it was, they loved it. We t it was, you know, Tolstoy in a time of coronavirus. And, you know, I think he has always a lot to say to us. But I'm actually, as you were talking, Shama, I was thinking about, I think Said has a book, Edward Said, which I think is called Paratexts. And he talks about, you know, it's, it's really this, I, I love this romance to context of the, the fragments and the pieces you put around in the footnotes and so on. But one of the things he talks about is the function of an epilogue, which seems oh. to be an attempt to put an extra closure on, but it, it usually it paradoxically has the effect of the word beyond the word. Um, and I see this so strongly in Tolstoy where, you know, and I would tie it to, to Morrison, right? This whole idea of, of, of um, absolute language, this desire in Tolstoy to say a final word, but he's constantly working against that himself. He's constantly taking that apart. So it's not just an epilogue. And then another epilogue, and he's already written 1200 words. I said this to my poor first years, so many words, and he keeps talking, which, you, and then he adds that essay, right? So he, he, so this, this, and I feel that tension Whereas with Dostoevsky, and I think I would say also with George Eliot, the finale, that epilogue is a deliberate, uh, they're, they're quite comfortable with, they're trying to do that opening up. So I, I, I just, those things I was thinking about as I listened to you, and it's so nice to see you, Shama, and I'm going to run and answer more emails. So. And you'll come in June too, right? Yes, I'll come in June, looking really, really forward to it. So, paka всем, до свидания. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for Said, uh, Melissa. I, yes, I, it's I, a good I, book. It's actually very interesting. I think it's okay. called Paratexts. Yeah. Okay. I have only read Said about the beginnings and not about endings. And um, yeah, uh, but, but I, I right hope it's him. I hope it's him. I think it's Jeanette. Jeanette. Oh, it's Jeanette. Jeanette. Maybe you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. It's Jeanette. You're right. Oh, uh, I have read Jeanette, Sorry, but right? not the yeah. chapter. I, I haven't <laughs> realized yet something on the epilogues. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Because the Paratext book, of course, I know, but I haven't read the epilogue i haven't that was also a long time ago and um yeah i think i yeah i think melissa is right because you have uh, this tension well that that dostoevsky is more comfortable with this ending because he can open up beyond the text and promise us some something that will happen which will be better than the, than the text actually or than the, the the story of the of the text while while Tolstoy does not well he cannot come to an end obviously Okay, um, we have a question from Eugene Clay. Um, thank you for your fascinating lecture. You mentioned the problem of political censorship as one reason for the particularly Russian problem of ending a novel. Surely this is true for Tolstoy who wanted to address the Decemberist uprising and never quite gets there. Could you say more about the question of censorship and the ending? Is it Nikolai at the end of the first epilogue, the Decemberist of 1825? Who? I don't know, actually. It's an interesting um, question, but I don't know. Kate, can you help? Uh, sorry, Wait. no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question that was very close to this one. Okay. Um, so maybe I could. Maybe you can answer it. Eugene, maybe. maybe uh, I will try to say something uh, in that direction, but correct me if I'm taking it in the wrong direction. But um, the, the, the first epilogue of, uh, of War and Peace ends with Nikolinka's dream, right? Mm -hmm. And Nikolinka's dream uh, is where he is uh, together with Pierre, he and, and his father, I believe, uh, is there as well. He's uh, going um, up against uh, um, the enemy, right? Uh, he's, he's imagining everything in this kind of Roman, uh, ancient Roman Republican uh, mm -hmm. imagery surrounds the whole thing. And essentially we are meant to understand that Nikolinka, and since Pierre and, um, and Nikolai had just had this argument about um, secret societies into which Pierre has been entering, uh, we are meant to understand that uh, at the horizon of this novel is the December uprising which is of mm -hmm. course, you know, at the origin of this novel as well in, in a certain sense. So mm -hmm. my question was, I guess, uh, related to this, this, you know, this problem of like a novel gesturing towards a certain horizon that is beyond it, but that is nevertheless recognizable by the reader, right? The, 
-hmm. you know, uh, crime and punishment gestures towards certain horizons in the future, a developmental plot of some kind, or, or yet another deed, heroic deed that Kate mentioned. Uh, and, and in the case of War and Peace, the gesture is towards, uh, you know, everybody knows what, what comes next, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's the December surprising. So in a way, it's an idyll, it's a family idyll, yes, and it's sort of boring-ish, at the same time, it's it's uh, it's pointing forward uh, towards a kind of um, really rather dramatic uh, future, a future that is, in fact, all about instability, all about crisis, um, right? And so, yeah. So I guess you know this this I I was wondering if you thought about um, that dimension of the epilogue, which seems to go a little bit counter to the idea that the epilogue is all about sort of stasis? No, I, I, it's very interesting. I haven't thought about it, but um, it, is inter it is a very interesting idea in so far as the epilogue is so boring. Maybe it's only boring for me, I don't know. But I had, a, I had such a hard time to read it. Uh, and that's what made it so fascinating to me that, that it's, I mean, because I liked the novel and then I came into this epilogue and it was deliberately boring and confusing, I think, for the for the reader. And maybe this has something to. I don't know. Maybe you don't agree, but um, for me, it was hard I to love, read. I love the epilogue. I have to say, oh. like everything. About it. Uh, I but, thought it was tormenting me seriously. Yeah. But um, it is also if you if you think about censorship to 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 I don't know to to bore the censor. Maybe you read this. And to confuse him, it would be a very good strategy, I, I think, in order to not to to point to the evident what is what is the law. I, I mean, I think that I think that the December uprising in in eighteen sixty six uh, was not off limits. It was something that people talked about and talked about in public. As far as the censorship is concerned, it was not an issue of censorship, but it, I think it was an issue of you know Tolstoy is writing about history. He's not. I mean, among other things, right? He is, he, I think the horizon of this private life, and it's an epic in a certain sense, the horizon of this private life is a broader horizon than just these, you know, adventures. Mm -hmm. There's a war, war of 1812, there is, you know, all of these other things. And ultimately there is the, the December uprising and frankly, the emancipation during which he is, mm -hmm. he is in fact writing, right? So once we take into consideration that histo broader historical horizon, the novel is really kind of more than itself, right? Mm -hmm. Is okay. engaging this, this uh, you know, in a similar way in which, you know, Greek tragedians were, were aware of the fact that everybody knew the myths on which mm -hmm. the tragedies were based and w therefore placed the tragedies in dialogue with the myths. So here Tolstoy, I think, is doing something mm -hmm. like this as well. So this that's mythologized, what- This mythologized uh, story of Russian history. Mm -hmm. This fits to to Brian Boyd to the quote I had from by Brian Boyd uh, about Ulysses, uh, the Odyssey. Um, so it's about what what do future generations how do they read it? Can they understand it? How how do they do they see this um, myth? I'm sorry about the light. It's somehow strange. It's getting dark. Um, thank you. Anyway, I wrote everything down. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about something else, but it, do, it doesn't really fit to the to the novels. But um, I wrote in, um, I was working on melodrama, on Russian melodrama, uh, in, uh, on melodramatic films uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, and there we have a cultural problem with the endings, because uh, the Russian melodrama dramas, well, the Russian movies had two endings. They had a Ruski finale, and uh, for the export, they got a happy ending. So you have a sad ending for the Russian. Uh, Russian uh, public and, uh, and a happy ending for the for the Americans who, who watch these movies so that is also uh, could also be taken into consideration it doesn't fit into to this but you also have culturally marked endings somehow obviously which would be worth to think about I don't know um, since Sasha is having um, connection problems I am going to call on I'm actually, I'm okay now, but I just wanted to warn you just in case. So everyone, if I cut out, I'm sorry about that. I'll try and go, come back in as fast as I can. But for now, I'm all right. Um, but I'll let you know. Yeah. So you I, just, I just wanted to call on uh, Christine, who's been patient. 
Please. Sure, please go ahead. And just a reminder to everyone, um, some people are sending me private messages. So I, I have an order. I promise I'm calling on you in order. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but please, yes, Christine, go ahead and um, unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. Um, I feel a little awkward as a historian intervening in a, a literary discussion, but I, I was struck by the fact that as a historian, we also struggle with endings, right? It's not just a literary problem. And the problem is, is when, when does your story end? And how do you determine that? And so in my case, what I would say is that it's the issues that I'm discussing that would determine an ending. And historians, of course, use events frequently to make that decision of, okay, I'm going to stop here, like the Russian Revolution or something like that. But I was struck, Shama, by what you said at the very beginning about how Russian realist novels are dealing with these rather large thematic issues, and they deal with a lot of them all at once, if, which is one reason why they're so long. And I wonder if if it's hard, if you're talking about God and love and history and literature to, to sort of figure out which of those is the emphasis that you want to end with, if you can't bring them all together in, the, in, a, in a single moment. So that is a question. What do you, what would you, do you think that plays a role in this too? Yeah, um, I think, I think, uh, that they often do, cannot really decide, as, as we were talking about war and peace now, it is not only about the family life that is continued, it is also about history. Or when you take BSC, the, the death, deaths of all the people around are, are, uh, have, have very different dimensions. When I think about history, I would think that in, in history, in, in relation, uh, in history other than in, in literary, in, in literature, history tries to make sense and literature does not have to decide, I think. It can be more open. If you, as a historian, you tell a story, you, you, don't you think backwards to, so that you have a, have a sense, give, give, give a meaning to the beginning and to the middle and to the end, and you create a story. You have to create a story. While in literature, it's also, of course, beginning, middle, and ending, but they, it doesn't have to, to fit so much. You can, you can be more ambivalent and ambiguous with your story in comparison to a historian? Wouldn't you agree? Not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, think it, I think history, if well done, can be very ambiguous. Okay. Um, so um, so I, I, I think they do, do not really decide. And that's why, why you can, um, dealing with all those various aspects, they, they need not decide. And they can, like Tolstoy put, put various, uh, various aspects into his epilogue. And so Dostoevsky also does this, I think, because, yeah, because all the characters who die in, in, in um, Biese, they, they all have different, they, they embody different ideas and, and questions. And, and so they don't have to do this. They could, but they don't, I think. Okay. Hey, thanks. Can you, can, do you want to say something about this? Uh, yeah, well, well, it's interesting. I mean, I was thinking ab about a couple of things. Um, so, Biese, you were mentioning kind of the deaths, and I, I'm working on Biese at the moment, and one thing that strikes me, uh, has struck me a lot this time around working on Biese, is mm -hmm. the problem of a kind of marooned present, right? The, the, and this goes back in a way to the middle that Chloe was talking about. The problem with Biese is that there's all these events that took place prior to the beginning of the novel, mm -hmm. and there are somehow, we're supposed to read something into those events, right? They're supposed to be what made Stavrog in the way he is. They're supposed to be what made Shat of the way he is and yet mm -hmm. nothing is ever really told we will never really get anything concrete right and actually another interesting thing in relation to what yeah. we were talking about before is the question of the emancipation of the serfs which comes up in Biese a couple of times which is invoked by the narrator but in very very strange ways right as a kind of historical event that's not really 
that hasn't yet been interpreted, that can't yet be understood, that sort of has erupted and yet is still somehow um, uh, reverberating. So in a way, I think that, that Biesi is really a novel that's like stuck in a middle and a kind of unmoored present with, you know, all the characters are kind of thinking about revolutionary time and some kind of putative future. But, you know, basically the past and the future are both equally somehow cut off um, in, in that plot. Um, yeah. Um, so but maybe, but I have another question for you later, but maybe maybe should wait mm -hmm. till, till some other people have asked their questions. Jenny Flaherty, if you want to go ahead and ask a question, you can unmute yourself. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Shama. Um, really interesting talk. I feel like the question of, of, of ending kind of brings together a lot of things. So forgive me if my question in that spirit is a little vague, but I guess I, I'm, I'm, my mind keeps going to um, locating this in a stream of history. Um, if only because, I mean, even the adjective long is a historical claim because it's comparative. So I'm, I'm thinking, right, like of, well, what are we comparing the novel then to necessarily? And right, with, with the idea of the romantic fragment, so I think of poem, there's also short story and there's also folktale. So, so all three of these would have very different historical arguments that I think could be, you know, could all be um, combined. Um, but I guess, so, that's just a sort of a thought and a, and a question about, you know, is, is there, um, does the weight fall on any one of these? Um, I mean, I think, you know, with, with the evocation of some sort of major uh, historical commentary on the novel, right, like folktale kind of co comes, mm -hmm. comes up as a sort of broad, uh, compar uh, implicit comparison here. Um, but I think also, also poem as a sort of, um, ro you know, if, we, if we're aligning romanticism and, and, and poetry, um, and also short story as, you know, maybe sort of, sort, of, sort of the end of the novel, as well as its beginning. And that's really interesting, too. I mean, thinking about narratability, which is so much a part of this, is a historical question. I mean, what is narratable changes. Um, and then the question is, is why? Why is this narratable now and not narratable later? And I'm thinking too of um, the literary historical work done on um, let's get to the point where we can sustain a long novel. What are mm -hmm. the sort of historical conditions, literary historical conditions that make that possible? And this is, it's a really interesting question to me that like what, what are then, you know, then it becomes a problem that you can't stop, right? Like once you get to the point where, okay, we found length, we don't have to make a cycle anymore, we don't have to sort of have these arbitrary framing devices, like we're, we're off and running and now we can't stop. So, so what are the sort of historical conditions for, for, for both the sort of change in heart um, of the zeitgeist that now, now we, we want to stop um, and, and the difficulties of, of doing that. Um, so, and, and, and as I'm thinking, the, trying to locate all of this historically, not that there has to be one answer to it, um, I'm also thinking of, um, you know, just with the idea of bringing in temporality to help us make sense of this, what you make of, um, of, uh, of Jameson's distinction between sort of narrative time and then affect, which is also a kind of temporality for him, which I, I, was, I was trying to think back to, does it sort of correlate to, um, to something that you can't end? Um, because, and I say the reason why it fits into this question of, of, of historicity is affect is the thing that for him, like kind of ends the novel or disintegrates realism because, you know, you sort of, um, it's this weak temporal pole, it undermines narrative and you sort of just left in this, you know, multitudinous subjectivity that's also this presentism and like, what do you do with that? So, um, so those are some Many, many thoughts, sorry for the, uh, the disorganization of them, but essentially the question of, um, of historicity. And, and I'd be curious to hear too, in particular, if you had um, sort of one uh, oppositional element in mind, right? The long Russian novel, well, longer than or long in comparison to, to, to what? And especially on this sort of historical uh, timeline. So thank you. Um, thank you. I think, um, it, yeah, the historical conditions is, uh, of course, it, it's very, uh, it's, it's a cultural thing, I think, and, and, and or, yeah, and a and, um, historical thing, because um, why, 
what did I have in mind um, compared to this? If we, even if you, if you go to Russia, you have, on the one hand, you have Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and on the other hand, you have Chernyshevsky, Studielaj, because Studielaj is closed. It is, it is, you have a deus ex machina in the end, and while you have this couple in the beginning, in the end, you have uh, two couples, and everything fits in very nicely, because what he's writing is a utopian future for the new, new man, and um, he closes it. It, it. It's not, it's not open. It is a, because it's a more a manifesto than a, than a novel, actually, a novel manifesto, maybe, for the new man. Um, so you are basically more or less at the same time. But um, why I thought about the long novels is not only that the novels are so thick, but because they don't stop, because they always, they, they have epilogues, or if you take Zerova Sonata, you have a text explaining it, and at the idiot is the same thing, you have an essay explaining Papo Vodou at the So wh why do they always, trans that was my question, why do they transcend their text? Why do they write more texts? instead of stopping. I mean, you could just end, like a Jane Austen novel, you just put it, you end it. It's, 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 it's yeah, it's not only that the marriage ended, ends it, but it is ended. She does not write any more about the text. While here, you always have a, a, a paratext that, uh, that, um, that um, are added to the text. And that, that was my basic question. And that's, that's what's, it, it's not long in comparison to a short story, but long in that they write more and more about it. And that's what I thought so fascinating. Um, and that's why they, they are so long also. I mean, if you add an epilogue of 200 pages, of course it, it makes the texts even longer. Um, so uh, so it was not, my, my starting point was not longer than what, but why does it go beyond the borders of the actual novel and, and continue? That's interesting. So, like excess. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's slightly different in my mind than 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 length, um, but mm -hmm. but related. Yeah. Donna um, Orwin, if you'd like to ask your question, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. Thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful discussion, which I didn't hear. Hi, Shama, and hi, Robin, and hi, all dear friends. I didn't hear the whole talk because the blasted uh, Zoom meeting. I couldn't get the sound going but I have gotten a lot of it. And I just want to make one point about War and Peace, that when Tolstoy wrote War and Peace, there's a story of how he lay on his couch in sort of a dream and he dreamed it up. This is how he wrote his fiction. And he didn't correct what came into his mind in that state. So you have a kind of Fiction, fictional side of the novel, which is uh, a product of the imagination, and he doesn't correct it. Then you have the epilogue, which is about the questions that come out of that, mm -hmm. th that imagining, and, and uh, the imagining is bigger than those questions. But, the, but I like, yeah, I love, I, I've come to love even the second epilogue, because I think of it as <laughs> as his meditation, as, as another side of the soul, another side of the human interior life, uh, cogitating on what he's produced through that imagination. And history is very important here too, because it's another way of, of, um, of, of um, structuring the, the, the product of the imagination. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Was that a, that was not a question, was it? No, it's it's just a, 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 a it's just a cogitation. I wish I could <laughs> just sit down and 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 discuss it with you. And, oh, and, and I should say, by the way, that I, I I have had very great success in teaching War and Peace, and the mm -hmm. way I do it is that each part I actually uh, focus on a different literary device or different part of the literary of the form of the novel. So we go through the novel on the one hand, and, and, and it turns out, you know, that there's just so much there um, that, 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 uh, that, that, it, it, that each lesson is structured in that way. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could do some co-teaching over Zoom. That would <laughs> so, be interesting, yeah. So <laughs> yeah. Approach is combined with our unsuccessful ones. <laughs> anyway, I'm off to teach the Sevastopol sketches, so uh, online and in person, so wish me luck.
to the yeah. <laughs> and let's hope the technology works. <clears throat> Thank so, you. You're welcome, Shaman. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Bye. Goodbye. Um, do we have, I don't see any more questions in the chat. Um, does anybody else have any questions? I know Kate said you had something that you would, we were thinking of bringing up later, but maybe you can go ahead and ask about yeah, that. Yeah, it was, I mean, mine was kind of an extension of what Jenny asked, which is kind of, I guess, the, the historical and cultural element of, um, of this question. Um, because it does seem as though um, this is the kind of also uh, the the sheer length seems to be particularly concentrated in these couple of in these couple of decades, right, of the 1860s and the 1870s, and once we get into the 1880s, there do seem to be many many more short stories, many more povesty, and so mm -hmm. on. So I was just wondering if it was if whether you had thought about the sort of the historic the, the the kind of historical questions I guess that Jenny was asking about. Um, if this kind of forms part of the larger project or not? Um, no, actually, but I'm, um, I'm, it's, it, it should be. I'm, I, I'm very interested in beginnings and endings, not only in beginnings of endings of texts, but also of epochs, for example, how does, uh, wh wh how, when does realism start or when does uh, romanticism end? Um, um, and that's also connected, of course, about stories. I just wrote a text about, um, um, foundation narratives also how how does a how does an epoch uh, a period a literary period start and um, when do people write about it like for example uh, it, it seems interest it's very interesting because it seems that these epochs that it, you usually need two foundation myths like romanticism starts with Zhukovsky basically in Russia and 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 uh, with a uh, with a discussion about translations and about hexameter and so on and then once again it starts with uh, with uh, with narratives about Pushkin so you have a double beginning and and the same happens in in realism actually that you have two two foundation uh, narratives so um, no, but I haven't no I haven't thought about this. It's also about, when you think about Polish literature, it's actually very similar to Russian literature because you have these huge huge books um, like Lalka by by Prus or Emancipantki, um, also by Pr Prus. And um, no, I don't know. I, I, I one should look at this. It would be. It's not it's not a real project. But I come back again and again to beginnings and endings, and I would like to turn this into a project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah. No, not yet. Any other questions from anybody? Sure. Um, I mean, it's not so much a question as an observation. Thank you, Shama. This was really lovely. Um, I was I was thinking about the various ways in which you framed the discussion. You know, having to do with political history on the one hand, history of aesthetics on the other, and also a certain kind of material or media history. And I, I was, of course, very convinced um, by, by Anne's question as well about like how this ultimately has to do in some sense with serialization, with public discourse, perhaps with the shape of public discourse and the possibilities for public utterance as they evolve in Russian political history. Um, but since the title of the talk had realism in it, I, I, as the discussion came to its close, I found myself thinking more about realism. And it occurred to me just to point out one thing, it's not really a question, it's just a, a little item, which is that, um, so with crime and punishment in particular, um, as Holquist pointed out long ago, it's actually not a realist ending. Like that ending is not possible in realism because it's miracle, it's, you know, mm -hmm. you can't have resurrection, yeah. which is why, um, the epilogue is an epilogue, right? Because it's actually the thing that won't fit into a realist text. Mm -hmm. And so I guess just towards the end of discussion, I find myself wondering about what your project can tell us about realism, because it seems like what you're looking at, because Kretrova Sanata, also, the explanatory thing is not a realist text. It's perhaps a, a, a manifesto, perhaps a treatise, perhaps a religious text, it was a Pickle, you know, whatever, but it's not a realist fiction. Mm -hmm. So it seems like, and same with War and Peace epilogues, right? Particularly the second epilogue, it is a meditation on history. It is not a realist fiction. Mm -hmm. Like it's, I mean, it's not as neatly a, re, like a, a text that works according to the conventions of realist prose fiction. So 
it just occurs to me that like maybe part of what you're looking at are these um, kind of tail tales that don't quite fit into realism. Mm -hmm. And again, the thing that I'm most convinced about, I guess, is the notion that, um, you know, that realism as a kind of machine subsumes, you know, other kinds of utterance, other kinds of text. Um, and that like maybe these so-called departures from it are actually attempts again at like the very similitude you identified, I think, in your fourth point. Um, so I guess all this is just to say it's a really generative topic. It's a really generative talk. I think it can tell us a lot about realism, both in an aesthetic and in a really historical key. Um, I don't really have a question, but just I found myself thinking about um, like what I learned about realism from your talk. And I think I learned that um, it's really fun to try to contextualize it in the various ways that you have. So thank you so much. Thank you too. It, um, I think realist, uh, that, that was also one of my aspects that, that you have realist or, or you have texts and realism which try to be realistic, but they're always subverted somehow. Like we talked about Ablomov and, and the, the how do, idyll, idyll? How, what is it in English? Idyllic? part in it so um or or the the epilogues that that or other the parts which which try to disturb this realism so we we you're right to observe this because we all all the time we have realism and at the same time it's it's subverted because um it doesn't doesn't quite fit and um it would be interesting to compare this i think to to other to western european realist novels because i i don't I don't know. <laughs> they are very different, I think, uh, because they only they usually concentrate on something, and then um, they are not as as overcrowded as the Russian novels, which have so many topics, and so they 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 usually tell a story, and um, which is also ambivalent and also full, but not not as overcrowded as the Russian novels, I think. And I don't know what, whether the, this subversiveness also could be found in Western European realist novels. I haven't looked at that, but, and what, you wrote something and I didn't, re, couldn't, it's, it's gone. <laughs> no, no, see. it doesn't. Uh, I just said that I love Bella's image of realism as sort of this all consuming mouth and whatever it can't digest, it kind of extrudes as epilogues. Mm -hmm. You know, some some other, or maybe as letters, like in Shlodiel, it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's trying to eat everything, but some things are not digestible. Oh, you have the, the, the dream in, of, uh, the fourth dream of uh, Vera Pavlovna in, in yeah. Shlodiel, which is also, as you say, it's anti-realist. It's not, it doesn't fit into this. It, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course. That is. Any other questions? I just wanted to say thank you again because it was such it, it's such a pleasure to step back and look at some of the texts that we that we write about and teach and then think about them together and you know kind of in these in in one big framework. It was really really interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving us this forum. It's I, oh, I, I, I really it's been enjoyed great. it. It's um yeah, it's great. Thank and thanks for your ideas. So I'll see I, I'll reread the epilogue and maybe if I reread it often enough I will start to like it. Okay. okay.